Welcome everyone. We're going to let folks come in the doors here and kick it off in a minute or two. Welcome, welcome. We'll give it another 30 seconds or a minute and then we'll get started. Thanks for joining. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for tuning in to this webinar co-hosted by Supply Shift and Pure Strategies. We are thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled to have uh, a great panel of speakers here to talk about, um, well, the impact that we've had on the planet for decades, but now really coming to the forefront of what businesses are thinking about, um, how to mitigate that impact and understand that impact. So we're really excited to dig into that today. Uh, we've got four amazing panelists. We've got Indrani De Silva from Supply Shift. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we have Corian Colligan, Corian, excuse me, from Pure Strategies, uh, who has uh, done some great work with us to uh, uh, develop this new biodiversity assessment that we are actually launching today. Uh, Shell Lin from Business for Nature um, is joining as well, and Stacy Bagley from the UNEP. Um, the Nature Economy Program, the World Conservation Mon Monitoring Center, here to talk to us today uh, about this topic of biodiversity. So what do we hope to get from today's workshop, today's webinar, and then we'll kick it off to the speakers, is that first of all is what's the significance of biodiversity in the business landscape? Why it's essential to act now? Um, what are the real impacts that companies are having? And what are they starting to do about it? Um, we'll then dig into key frameworks um, companies are starting to use to understand their impacts, um, understand the um, global biodiversity framework and the EU's CSRD and how these uh, the implications within that new law for measuring impacts on biodiversity. And we'll also talk about how technology can facilitate uh, understanding for businesses about their impacts, understand the impacts in their supply chain. Um, so they can drive forward on that journey to sustainability. Um, so uh, really excited to have our speakers here today. We will kick it off in a second, but let's start with a poll question just to get a little bit of understanding from the audience about um, where you all are on the journey. So if we can pull up that first poll question. There it is. First poll question. Does your organization currently have a biodiversity strategy in place? Easy question to start. Uh, for some of you, it's early in the morning. For some of you, it's late in the day. So we thought we'd start it with a pretty easy question. And we understand that biodiversity really within the landscape of business planning um, is, is pretty new. So uh, we, uh, we have a guess on what the poll results might be, but please uh, go ahead and click on one of those and then we'll take a quick peek at the results. And then we will uh, kick it off with our first speaker. Da -da -da. All right, click, click, click. If you have it ready, here come the poll results. All right, actually, um, okay. So 24% have a biodiversity strategy in place, which I'm actually kind of surprised about, to be honest. I think um, a lot of companies are still trying to grapple with what this actually means for their business, but that's that's wonderful to see. Another 24% are in progress. That's, that's half of folks are uh, doing something already. And I guess the other half um, aren't yet, but... Um, I think that's really great to see that only 30%, um, 29% uh, haven't really planned to do anything yet. But that's, I think, for a, an issue like biodiversity with its uh, complexities and kind of uh, impacts that can be really diverse and difficult to understand, I think it's great to see uh, that there's a lot of action being taken. So uh, without further ado, let's turn it over to our first speaker, Colleen Corrigan from Pure Strategy, Senior Sustainability Advisor, um, to tell us a little bit more about the biodiversity impacts that businesses have kind of lay a foundation um, and then we'll go from there. So over to you, Colleen. 
Thank you so much, Jamie. Hello, everyone. So great to have you here. I'm going to spend a few minutes just orienting us to biodiversity, what it is and why this is important for us while you're here. The first slide here gives us an impression of the diversity of all living things, and that is essentially biodiversity. It's variation at different levels, including from the genetic level, as well as species that are in the water, on land, in the air, and the variety of all the different types of habitats and ecosystems across the planet. And importantly too, it includes us, all of the people living here on earth and the variety that we are. And all of this biodiversity is part of nature. You have heard, I'm sure, about the fact that we are losing biodiversity. And the crisis is the fact that we're losing it so quickly, even though we all depend on it, whether it's for business or personal. The Living Planet Report is a, a foundational document that the World Wildlife Fund um, determines annually. And one of the important elements of biodiversity is the fact that we've been tracking it for a while and it has been declining over this time. So for the past 50 years, the tracking has shown that the average wildlife populations have decreased by 70%. And that's a very striking finding. One of the aspects of this that's also important to consider is the fact that even though this is a global um, average, this varies depending on the region or the geography where you are. So the maps on the right-hand side show that location matters when you're assessing biodiversity. North America, for example, has quite a different decline in um, populations than Latin America and the Caribbean. Another aspect of biodiversity is the element of, of mass extinction. And the earth has so far had five mass extinctions and the current sixth mass extinction event is what we're undergoing currently. Scientists from IUCN have studied populations of species and have found an, over 500 of these have a population with fewer than 1,000 individuals left. And at least half of these have fewer than 250 individuals remaining in the population. These are the species that are likely to be lost during this mass extinction event. This is so important for business because business depends on functioning and healthy ecosystems. And all those species that are lost in those systems really have a strong impact on their functionality. Some of the services that businesses rely upon are the storage of carbon, cycling of water, with many who may have felt the impact of Canadian wildfires this year. Air filtration is also a very important part of the services we rely upon. Pollination is absolutely critical, as many I'm sure have heard, and more so with uh, some of the recent flooding that's in the news. Um, some of the ecosystem services that are provided around stormwater retention and erosion control and nutrient cycling is also important. And all of these services together are worth more than $150 trillion annually, which is about twice the world's GDP. An example of one of those services, the loss of pollinators, has been found to equate to around $577 billion at risk. Uh, and this is more than the combined value of four very large corporations. A really important aspect around biodiversity is and business is that they really affect each other. So nature and biodiversity affect business and are also affected by this relationship. There are $440 trillion of economic value that are potentially at risk because of this dependence that business has on nature. The loss of biodiversity is one of the top five threats that humanity faces in the next 10 years because of its relationship to the collapse of ecosystems. A more recent finding from IPBES is that the cost of managing invasive species is more than $423 billion annually, and they stress that that's likely an underestimate. And I'm sure many of you today have familiarity with invasive species in your own locations. A good point here is that 
opportunities related to these crises actually could lead to around 400 million jobs by 2030 if systemic transitions are taken within land use, infrastructure, and energy, for example. And then lastly, a key finding in this space is that to reverse this biodiversity crisis will cost around 600 to $800 billion annually. An essential aspect of biodiversity that's really important for business to understand is that it varies across the landscape. It's not one size fits all, it's not continuous. It is highly variable. And so location really matters. And this is why biodiversity is so critical for business and business to understand this relationship to geography. I share this map because anyone who's working in this space as a company will be familiar with how they relate to their landscape. So maps like this show, for example, some of the protected areas in green, and these have regulations where companies would not want to be um, having an impact in those areas. The red also indicates where biodiversity is at greatest risk. And you can see where the intensity of the red is, that's at highest risk. So it's really important for businesses to understand not only where their direct operations are located in the landscape, but also where their supply chain is uh, drawing from across the landscape and not only in the country where you are, but also across the world. So these kinds of insights are really important for making decisions and also prioritizing those decisions. So companies face risks and there are tools that exist. And so I'm really excited for the rest of the panel to share what some of those tools are. I'm just going to highlight here that the top five threats to biodiversity include invasive species, as I've just noted, climate change is very significant. The exploitation or over-exploitation of species, especially in the oceans, is another, is another critical threat for biodiversity in addition to pollution and then land use and sea use change, which can lead to uh, uh, high levels of deforestation across the globe. And a current or a recent study from S&P Global shows that 85% of the world's largest companies have a significant uh, dependency on nature across their direct operations, really signifying that all businesses really have a relationship to biodiversity, whether they impact or draw from it. So this is a really critical issue to be aware of. Right. Thank you so much. Colleen. Yes. So we're going to wrap up this little segment. Thank you so much, Colleen, with a with a poll question, um, just to think about um, a little bit more from you all. To what extent is nature important for your business? Um, well, those of you who have created a strategy might know already. Those who haven't uh, maybe don't know, but let's let's check this out. In the meantime, Colleen, um, you know, when I'm listening to you present, it's like, wow, these impacts are massive, right? They are they are a lot of dependencies, a lot of parts of the world. So for a company who is realizing that they're dependent on nature, they have an impact on nature um, and the impacts being so great, where should they start? What, what, where do you, I mean, we're going to look at this a lot more in, in the webinar. We're going to hear from the other speakers as well, but just to kind of hear from you before we turn it over to others, where, where do you begin to engage? Absolutely. It's such a great question, Jamie. And I think it's really important for companies to start by taking an assessment of their internal uh, operations and just stock of where they are on the landscape. As I noted with the map, it's so important to understand where that biodiversity is and how that interacts with the operations of a company. So I think being aware of that and in addition, partnerships, engaging with others, this is such a critical global issue that one company can't do it alone. It's got to be done collectively, but there is um, no time to lose. And there is the opportunity to also restore and regenerate. So I think a lot of positivity in this space too. Wonderful. Wonderful. We'll get back to more of those uh, in the Q and A. We'll think about what business can, can do. Thanks for that perspective, Colleen. I uh, want to encourage all of you to put uh, questions in the Q and A. We might be able to take those uh, in the, in the middle of the webinar or at the end. Uh, looking at our poll results, to what extent is nature important for your business? Okay, a few, it's not on the radar. 
a few a little. I think that's that's encouraging to see that uh, <clears throat> a, a really large majority of folks um, see that are, are doing something about it already, which is great um, and essential. You know, uh, that's almost 30 percent. We've set nature targets and are working with our supply chain and our customers to reduce impact. That's excellent. And uh, it, it's going to be a journey for those who are deep in it and a journey for those who haven't started. Um, so um, let's move on to our next speaker. Um, Shell is going to start to give us the policy and business perspective. So looking at the legal landscape, um, looking at uh, some action being taken on a global level to kind of push businesses to act. Um, and so that will kind of take us from, you know, from Colleen, from what is the impact into, okay, how, how are business being pushed to, to do more? So Shell Lynn, over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. And it's a really great pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Xiao Lin. I'm the Partners and Operations Manager at Business for Nature. Um, and I really enjoyed the wonderful presentation from Colin. And I think you did a really great job of you know, laying the business case for acting on nature. But we all know that for a business to act, it does not only take awareness of the importance of the issue, but it, it also takes you know, different external pressure points, for example, from investors, from policymakers, and from consumers, you know, oh, I think it takes the whole society to push businesses to do more. So from my presentation today, I would really like to focus on the policy perspective and, you know, see what are the latest developments that could enable more business action. So next slide, please. And firstly, I would just like to highlight a recent study um, that's conducted by the CDP that studied the state of mandatory environmental disclosure around the G20. Um, and on the right, you see you know, different maps that showcases kind of the, the different policies in different geographies. And if you go on their website, there is even more kind of interactive um, data that you can play with. But basically, the key findings here is that for climate related financial disclosure um you know that that is mandatory it is really starting to be mainstreamed and it's on track to become the norm and for water related disclosure it's also gradually maturing across different geographies you know policymakers are starting to push out more policies and regulations but then for bio biodiversity related disclosure it's still in its infancy so we heard from Colleen how critical this issue is for companies, and it's you know one of the top business risks down the road. But there is still so much to be done in this space, um, in the policy space. But with that said, I, I think my message today is that this status is really changing. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll show you why. So... As many of you might have heard of, last year there was a really important conference that took place in Montreal, Canada, and it's called the UN CBD COP15. So basically hosted by the UN Convention for um, Biodiversity, which is the kind of counterpart of the UNFCCC for climate. So you might be familiar with the COP27, COP28, etc. But then the Biodiversity COP is also um, gaining its importance on the global agenda. So what's significant about this conference is that a global agreement for nature was adopted by almost 200 countries, and it's called the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. You can think of it as the nature equivalent of the Paris Agreement for, for climate. So basically a paradigm shift, and with the you know, shared global goal adopted, the whole society will be able to collectively work together and reach um, these goals and targets. So after this GBF is adopted, the next step would be for it to, trans uh, to be translated into national policies, laws, and regulations. Um, and for governments, they are currently working on updating their national biodiversity strategy and action plans called NBSAPs, uh, which is also the nature counterpart of the NDCs for UNFCCC process. So uh, it, it is essentially a roadmap for governments to implement the GBF um, in the coming years and by 2030, the latest. What's really important here is that we all know it not only takes governments to achieve all these goals because um, they are ultimately only a part of the society, but their role will be to convene you know, different actors in the society to achieve these goals together. And business sector is absolutely critical um, in this process. Um, and 
operations is only kind of part part of their impact and dependencies, but value chain would help uh, capture the whole picture. So I think that really ties into today's topic of why value chain engagement would be essential um, in the coming years. And next slide, please. So now let's have a really quick look of what's in this global biodiversity framework. Um, you can think of it as a two-phase approach. Um, the first phase is from now to 2030 with the mission of halting and reversing biodiversity loss by 2030. So basically meaning that we stop that loss and coming from negative to zero, and then from 2030 to 2050 will hopefully increase the abundance of biodiversity and reach the point of living in harmony with nature. Next slide, please. There are many targets in the framework, um, 23 in total, and actually many of them are relevant for businesses. So having a quick look here, you see you know, the 30 by 30 conservation target, pollution, sustainable use, agriculture, consumption, et cetera, et cetera. But then if we go to the next slide, today I would really like to emphasize target 15, which we often call the business target. That's because um, basically the content of this target is um, you know, for the first time that governments explicitly say that they will start to require large businesses and financial institutions to assess and disclose their risks, impacts, and dependencies on nature, not only in their uh, not only in their operations, but also through their supply chains and value chains and portfolios. So. This is really a groundbreaking target um, and has huge implications for what's expected from companies because for the first time they will be held accountable for their action on nature and it might have uh, regulatory and legal consequences as well. Now, the reason why you see assessment and disclosure here in comparison to you know, other type of action that you can do on nature is because um, we really see this as the starting point for businesses to act. Um, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. So starting from this material assessment, you'll be able to understand the business's relationship with nature and then be able to develop your strategy and targets and take the you know, following steps. So um, basically, this is the core of the target. Of course, it has some other elements that I won't expand on today. Um, but the next step will be for this target to be implemented on the national level following the update of MBSAPs and by 2030 the latest. So we, um, while different countries act you know, at a different speed based on where they are um, with their mandatory disclosure requirements, but um, it's, I think, a good, really good news today that we are already seeing this target of being implemented in the EU. And if we go to the next slide, I am very pleased to uh, introduce the CSRD, which is the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, under which biodiversity is really becoming a key requirement for disclosure in the EU. So basically CSRD is adopted this year in January, and then uh, soon after the ESRS, the European Sustainability Reporting Standard was adopted in July as well. It has many different standards, you know, some are, if, um, required for all companies. Some are required only if material covering different topics, climate, biodiversity, pollution, you know, workers along the supply chain, you name it, but various ESG issues. Um, and biodiversity is a key component. There are many companies that are covered, um, actually around 50,000 large companies and SMEs in total. So this is really the largest scope of mandatory disclosure that we've ever seen so far um, in the EU on sustainable reporting. So really a great news, but also it has huge implication on the US companies as well, because we see around um, 3000 US companies will be covered either, you know, because they're listed in the EU or they have EU subsidiaries. And the uh, reporting actually also starts pretty imminently. For many companies, it will start from 2025 and covering the whole year of 2024. So basically from January next year, you need to start collecting all these informations and have the um, you know, infrastructure set up in the company. But then there are some other companies that follow suit in the coming years, for example, SMEs and companies that are not covered under um, FRD. So they could have a little break to have this preparation phase. 
Also tying to today's topic, um, I wanted to emphasize that value chain is at the core of the CSRD reporting. Um, it's also at the first time that you know information from your upstream and downstream impact will be required and not only your operations. So I think that this will be a great challenge for companies, but it's also very positive because um, it, it will capture you know, the most impact and dependencies um, along the chain so that we can create changes together. Another key feature of the CSRD is that it has a double materiality lens, meaning that companies not only need to report um, you know, the impact of the outside world on them, but also their impact on the planet and on our society as well. So um, this really you, you know, makes, it, makes it a more comprehensive approach comparing to the current um, reporting requirements. Next slide, please. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the biodiversity standard within ESRS, you're more than welcome to read more as we'll share the slides afterward. But um, you can see some key components here already, you know, the strategy and business model, how biodiversity is tied into, um, you know, these key strategies within your company, as well as the impact risks opportunities, the process that you use to um, assess your material impacts, your policies, actions, resources, targets, uh, metrics, financial effects. So pretty all-encompassing. Um, I won't go too deep into it today, but again, you're more than welcome to, to read more and understand what's covered in the standard. Next slide, please. So uh, besides the policy Im implication that we discussed today, I would also like to take this um, opportunity to to share a key resource that could be useful for companies to take action on nature. I'm sure Stacy will actually expand on it a lot, but this will be kind of an intro to this topic. And um, so actually earlier this week, Business for Nature along with uh, WBCSD and the World Economic Forum have launched 12 reports and overviews for key industry, industry sectors to understand their major impact dependencies and priority actions that they could take to contribute to a nature positive economy. Um, so Stacy will cover that, you know, last year we had the Act D framework, which provide the high level, high level steps that companies can take. And now we really have this sector um, overview to help companies understand more about what actions there, um, there, there could be. So I think the message is that just there is a lot of resources and guidance out there. Next slide, please. But also within these reports and overviews, um, value chain is really emphasized throughout because each sector's impact and dependencies exist not only within their operations, but actually even more along their value chain. Um, so it's really essential for businesses to engage their suppliers as well as consumers along the chain to, um, you know, make positive changes. And I will just give an example here, you know, for example, a food company that produces chocolate, uh, the impact and dependence is not only exist in the, you know, production or retailing process, but maybe even more in the uh, raw material sourcing process, you need to consider where the cocoa comes from, where the palm oil comes from, and you know, does it have deforestation implications? Um, and being able to you know trace back to to that point, but also um, downstream, cons considering consumers, you know, how do you raise awareness? How do you educate them about these topics so that they could make responsible choices when they um, make the purchases? So these are just some examples of uh, being able to engage the value chain along the biodiversity issue. We also provide um, biodiversity, sorry, we also provide the value chain mapping in different sectors, and that will also enable companies to assess, disclose, and also engage their stakeholders on this topic. And um, this slide just shows some examples, but there will be more in the knowledge materials. Um, and with that, um, I'll end my presentation today, and I'm sure Stacy will expand a lot more on the tools and guidance. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shell. Uh, uh, before we move on to Stacy, for those of you who weren't paying close attention, I just want to make sure it's clear that this like is is really big. How I mean, five years ago to think that that this many companies be pressed to understand their impacts so deeply and report on them publicly is kind of earth shattering. 
And it does put a huge amount of pressure on companies to figure out a lot of things that they probably didn't know about before. Um, so the next segment of the, uh, the next two segments of the webinar are really going to be into kind of what to do, right? Nuts and bolts. Okay, we got the, we understand the relationship between business and nature. We understand what now the, the kind of high level frameworks and pressures are. Before we move on to Stacy, Shell, I'm just wondering, you know, there, uh, in addition to CSRD, um, there's also the kind of GRI and IS, ISSB frameworks. Um, are, do those also include biodiversity as specifically as, as, as CSRD does? And our companies who have been doing GRI and ISSB reporting, are they prepared for what's coming in CSRD or is it kind of a new ballgame? That's a really great question, Jamie. And I think uh, the good news in a nutshell is that both ISSB and GRI are developing or updating their biodiversity standard. So especially for GRI, I think they will launch their new biodiversity standard by the end of this year. So you'll be so we'll be able to see biodiversity being mainstreamed in all these um, you know voluntary frameworks that companies currently use to disclose. But also there is significant alignment between all these standards. So I think there ultimate goal is not for companies to duplicate their efforts, but to make sure that everything is aligned and they can, for example, use their GRI materials to fit into their CSRD reporting. So, um, well, that's done through, you know, a lot of collaborations as well as consultation processes. So I think com companies can be assured that all oh, these standards are complementing each other rather than competing where, you know, diverting attention from companies. Yeah, we are seeing a lot of convergence out there. Great. Well, without further ado, let's turn it over to Stacy Bagley, um, a senior program manager um, in the Nature Economy Program at UNEP, uh, United Nations Environmental Program. Stacy, we're going to get into measurement, supply chains, what companies can do step by step to start getting in there. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Jamie. And I think Colleen and Shell have done an excellent job at setting the scene on the importance of biodiversity to business but also what some of those core drivers are, what we're seeing in terms of that mandatory and voluntary disclosure landscape. So what I wanted to do in my presentation was to try and get into a bit more of the nuts and bolts. So what are some of those key challenges? What are some of the approaches or opportunities for business? As they start to think about how do they actually respond to these requests? How do they think about biodiversity management in their supply chain? So on the next slide, I wanted to introduce these four components. So Shell alluded to it as well, the assess, commit, transform, disclose, which is also known as the ACT-D or High Level Business Actions for Nature framework that Business for Nature released last year. And I think this provides a really useful framework for thinking through value chains and where some of those challenges and opportunities lie. So if we start with the challenges um, and go across these components, with assess, this is really where we're starting. So what we find is a lot of companies and one of the really common questions is, where do I start? Um, for the, many companies, they will have many suppliers, they will have long, complex supply chains. They'll be buying and sourcing commodities from different places that they do or don't know about. They'll be using products that have mixed ingredients or commodities in there. So what is it they can do to start to understand and get to grips with that is a, is a core challenge. And then when it comes to um, the commit stage, this is where you actually have some of that grounding information and you can start to think about how do you measure those impacts in your supply chain that in reality could be many tiers away from the, the business operations and it could require you to work across many different suppliers. So how do you set targets and measure progress with that? And this is where issues around traceability and supply chain data really start to come to the fore. And then from there, once you have your, your assessment and your commitment and you're starting to think about how to take action, how to actually transform your approach to value chains, and how do you actually start to manage some of those impacts you've identified? And this can be really challenging in terms of that onus of control shifts when it's your direct operations, you can often de determine what actions you want to take, you can put the policies guidelines in, but when you don't have that level of direct or financial control, how do you actually work through your suppliers in a meaningful way to actually get action um, on the ground and actually have an impact, a positive impact on them? And then finally, how do you disclose? Um, so as Shell was saying, there's this increased push towards businesses disclosing on their value chain impacts and dependencies. 
But this again is quite a challenge compared to direct operations as you're relying on the actions of others in terms of actually doing that transform action step. Or you may need to bring in proxy data that isn't specific to your own supply chain. So there's particular nuances around that disclosure piece, which is currently being navigated at the moment. So then to take each of these in turn and look at where we are, what some of the current state of play is, and starting with assess, as we've seen, there is a lot happening this in this space. There's a lot of guidance tools for businesses to start to try and get to grips with this. So I think we're in a good time, but we're also in a learning time. So I think businesses just need to try to get to grips with this and start to take those steps uh, where they can. And with assess, really, the, the main aim is to pinpoint those most material issues and guide the business on where they should focus and prioritize given all of these moving pieces and complications. And there's some great um, guidance and consensus around what's happening in TNFD and SBTN to think about a more robust approach to materiality assessments. And this can really help guide a business through um, a certain structure and give them the information they need in terms of where to highlight certain impacts or pressures in the value chain that they might not be aware of otherwise. And there are lots of different tools and guidances out there to help businesses with this. The Encore database has lots of useful information on materiality. You can use input output models to estimate pressure. And SBTN has some amazing resources as part of their assess step, including a materiality screening tool and also a high impact commodity list that can help drive that attention in the right areas. So this is all about focusing your data gathering in the areas that you need to, where there are most significant impacts, dependencies. And I like this quote at the bottom, data overload can result in decision paralysis. Essentially what we need to be doing is collecting data in a way to enable better decisions rather than just going, let's get it all in and then having an overload of information. So I think there's some great tools and guidance to help with that. And then on the next slide, we come to commit. So this is where you're starting to look at how you measure, how you set, how you track, and traceability is absolutely core in this step. So once you've got your idea of where to focus, the question is then how do you use traceability to get to that level of transparency and accountability for your value chain? And where you don't have those, there are evolving ways to use proxy measures. So you can start to estimate impacts even if you don't know exactly where you're sourcing from. Um, and there's various tools, technology, we'll hear about one of them today uh, that companies can start to use to try and navigate this. But again, the consensus is we just need to start with what we've got and build over time. It's going to be iterative. And I think the next slide illustrates this quite nicely. This is taken from the step two prioritize guidance from SBTM. And I think this is a really nice visual way of how you can start to think about this iterative approach. So the entire bar that you see would represent a particular pressure, for example, water use. The green part of that bar is where you know information on where you're sourcing to at least country level, ideally further than that. Um, but it recognizes we don't necessarily have that. So the brown bar is the, the brown part of the bar is where you don't know in the world uh, where in the world you're sourcing something from. And the idea is you can set targets around what you do know while you start to work on the areas that you don't know. So this is where you start to think about how you can engage with your suppliers to increase levels of traceability, but also think about how you can take different decisions and transform your way of doing business. So where can you bring in circularity? How can you change the design of your products to reduce that reliance on your supply chain and that need for traceability? And then as that builds over time, you'll be able to expand the scope of your targets to cover more of your supply chain. So really about thinking about what we do know, setting targets, what we don't know, and filling those gaps. And on the next slide, there are various guidances out there. I'm not going to go into much detail on this today, but the Align project is looking at standards for corporate biodiversity measurement and valuation, which includes supply chains as well as direct operations. And they released their guidance in December last year, but they're also working on some more specific aligned supply chain guidance, which will be released in the coming months. So one to look out for if you're interested. So on the next slide, getting into that, the meat of it, what do we do? Why, how do we take action? What is it we're looking to transform? 
And this again happens at different scales, both at that corporate level, at the macro level with people on the ground. And businesses can start to think about the changes they have lots of control over, so their own sourcing decisions, how they design products. But ultimately, we need to be changing behaviours on the ground at that more production type level. And this is where where you sit in the supply chain really matters. It determines how much control you have, how much leverage you might have over the actions of others. And as I say, there's a generally an assumption that for most, the biggest impacts will be at that production level, not always the case. But what it does mean is many are looking towards those more agricultural or, or mining production landscapes where those are happening. And there we can't just require best practice. There needs to be the right incentives in place. So there's a lot of thinking about how do you work with smallholders and incentivize the action? How do you work at landscape level in multi-stakeholder partnerships? And this um, graphic on the right here is from the Tropical Forest Alliance. It's a really nice way of showing the different types of actions and the different axes that need to come into play to try and influence action at that landscape level. And then on the next slide, um, oh, I forget what I get. If we we come to disclose. Um, so this is really how do we bring all of that together? How do we talk about the way in which we've assessed and, and made our prioritization, the way in which we've taken commitments, the way in which we've taken action? Um, so as I say, the scope of disclosure here is, is really important. And this will iterate over time as you have more of your value chain that's been assessed and you achieve more levels of traceability. But being really transparent about what you do know and how you're looking to fill those gaps as part of your disclosure. And also the impacts and dependencies piece are really important. So what have you identified as those material ones? How have you assessed them? How will you again work to fill those gaps in future? But the other element of disclosure is then what are you doing? Like, how are you responding to this? So how do you disclose on actions and outcomes? So many frameworks will talk about policies and actions that are being put in, in place in response to those identified impacts and dependencies. But there are also questions about how to monitor and report on outcomes, particularly when you start working at that multi-stakeholder landscape, landscape level. How do you attribute the changes to an individual organization when by nature they are being taken by lots of different parties so again there are a number of things that we will work out over time as these disclosure frameworks come to the fore but really starting just to think through that being transparent about what you do know and how you're approaching things is really important and um, so yeah that's a hand back to you Jamie I didn't realize that's a lot in eight to nine minutes Thank you, Stacey. I mean, what I'm the key takeaway I'm hearing, there's a lot of key takeaways, but one of them is that this is a, an iterative process, right? That is, it's you can't figure out everything all at once, and you've got to keep getting through the layers even while you're setting targets and starting to report. The other key thing I'm hearing is that knowing your supply chain, engaging your suppliers is critical. Uh, you, there are tools to estimate your impact, but in the end, knowing where your goods come from and knowing what your suppliers are doing is the key to it. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Indrani De Silva at Supply Shift. This is going to tell us about a new supplier biodiversity assessment that we have just launched um, at Supply Shift to really focus on, on that very thing. How do you dig into your supply chain to um, get the key data you need for reporting and understanding impact? So over to you, Indrani. Thank you, Jamie. And um, thank you, Colleen, for sharing with us some key business case and tr the re revealing the true complexity of biodiversity. Shell, your aspects of uh, focused on nature-based policies and, and how they impact business is so helpful. And Stacy, your work on frameworks and really um, highlighting how transparency is key is um, setting me up for this next introduction. So thank you. Again, my name is Indrani De Silva. Welcome, everybody. I'm the Sustainability Solutions Advisor for Supply Shift. Um, in my role, I help companies evaluate their sustainability performance by leveraging Supply Shift's technology to ensure greater transparency and supply chain visibility. Next slide, please, Jamie. Thank you. We're powering the shift to um, to sustainable supply chain. So Supply Shift, just giving a brief introduction here, is a cloud-based software engineered to enhance supply chain transparency and drive sustainable procurement practices. So we are a platform that covers all ESG topics 
and and including biodiversity, which we're going to talk about later today because we're we're showcasing our assessment. So that that is us. And here we're looking at the building blocks on this slide for a sustainable supply chain. I would like to highlight a few ways that supply shift can help provide a more comprehensive view to foster enhanced engagement with suppliers. Now we understand that biodiversity and sustainability is a journey. So understanding material business, biodiversity issues and their impacts in your supply chain um, is something that's, as Jamie just said, an iterative process. So you, you need the, the tools to be able to continue to see in real time data what your suppliers are doing and, and how they're doing. So here I want to emphasize a few points. First is the objective of being able to discover who your suppliers are, where they are, and what they're doing in your supply chain. So how you can better manage is by actually being able to measure it. And by measuring it, that is collecting this information in a standardized way. So the key here is you to assess allows you to understand, allowing you to understand allows you to influence and unlock opportunities and real incentives for your suppliers to be able to make progress towards these issues. Um, so that is the key on this factor. Then we'd go to managing risk, right? So once you've been able to collect that information, be able to see a holistic view of your supplier data, uh, you can see and identify key areas of risk that allow you to focus on prioritizing and taking action, very similar to what, what Stacy was saying, was really getting down to the being able to be uh, transparent and have visibility further into your supply chain and, their, and your specific suppliers. And then from there, we're talking about engaging our suppliers, we're bolstering using the tool in order to be able to engage your suppliers and plan, co-create, collaborate with them to see where they might need help and where they could best work with you and you with each other to make improvements. All of this with the idea of being able to drive impact, report and comply with, as Shell mentioned, the regulatory landscape is rapidly changing and increasing and a focus on biodiversity is maybe in its infant stage, but it's certainly something that companies want to get ahead of. So this is really how you can scale your impact and be able to have that greater visibility of the supply chain. If you could go to the next slide, please, Jamie. Thank you. All right, so Supply Shift and our, our partners at Pure Strategies um, have worked with our customers, have been done a due diligence and broad landscape analysis of what the problem of biodiversity and the complexity, as you heard from Colleen earlier, but then also how do we solve for this problem? How do we begin to have the tactical, practical tools like a biodiversity assessment in order to evaluate where we need to move forward? Or, and one of the things we discovered was there was a real lack of available tools to not only just address biodiversity risks, dependencies, and impacts, but also promote supplier, true supplier engagement in real time to build transparency in global supply chains. So hence, we the launch of our new biodiversity assessment. One, two things here I wanna, I wanna impress upon you is that why, why now? We know this is important, but why do businesses need to act? And I think Shell did a wonderful job of setting us up here and going deep dive into the CSRD. Um, we have a landscape, regulatory landscape here that is asking us to look at a much wider perspective of sustainability related issues. So we're needing to report for um, the, the new reporting legislation on the CSRD, both not only to the material biodiversity issues uh, and their impacts and risks and dependencies in our own business and our own uh, operated supply chains, but also our extended value chains. So we really need to be able, and that always is, is often more complex and more vague for companies. So really being able to have a practical starting point um, in a centralized way, a one single source of truth um, to be able not only to understand where your suppliers are, but then report on impact and comply with key legislation. Um, and being able to do this in a coordinated fashion. So uh, another thing that Shell, I want to 
I want to reemphasize here, I, I think it bears repeating, is the CSRD really emphasizes double materiality. This is a perspective and an approach of, of companies required to report on areas that they have a financially material impact that have an impact on their business financially, but also have a material impact on people and nature. This is a significant shift in a broader perspective that I do believe will be coming built more into upcoming legislation um, globally and is a way already for companies to get ahead and be prepared for whatever form of future legislation comes in. If we could go next, next slide, Jamie, please. Thank you. All right, so let's look at the biodiversity assessment and what it contains. Um, so there are seven sections here. I'll just briefly walk through a few. Um, of course, what, one of the first things is uh, general information. So one of the things that our customers appreciated in terms of a tool like the biodiversity assessment and in general our platform, having a cloud-based platform and standard solution that allows you to collect accurate, reliable data often contact information for suppliers are not clear. So even at the get-go, this is an issue where we need to get clear indication of the details of contact, contacts from our suppliers. So this is something that supply ship can do in a standardized way through our biodiversity assessment. Um, secondly, understanding management practices, collecting information, are there certifications in place? Have your suppliers considered biodiversity targets? Um, thirdly, we're, we're looking, collecting information on nature related conditions. This I'm going to spend just a few moments here a little bit closer. And this really looks at identifying the risks, asking questions and understanding it, collecting information on perceived risks from the supplier, their dependencies, their impacts, specifically also utilizing WWF's biodiversity risk and water risk indices. So being able to have location-based data and industry risk, that is, that is a, um, those are provided as technical guidance in the tooltip in the assessment that suppliers can um, put in their location and then specifically be able to see where the hotspots are related to the biodiversity risk and water risk. Um, third, and then moving further down, there's a section on uh, mitigating risks. What are the policies and procedures in place that companies have? Uh, management systems to indicate that. And certainly, what are the reporting frameworks and metrics that companies, um, suppliers are already using or considering? Um, where are they making those considerations in, say, a sourcing policy? As an example, does it consider biodiversity impacts? Um, and then social considerations, uh, a, a great section on the impact on local communities. So location-based is, is key for biodiversity. And as Colleen mentioned earlier, there is also a very important aspect of really understanding what communities within those locations and how they're impacted. How is stakeholder engagement designed and developed in order to make sure there's considerations for those local communities and the impacts from your business activities. So that's a key consideration that we ask our suppliers about as well. And then lastly, collaboration and opportunities where can suppliers, this is an opportunity for suppliers to share where they need the most help. This is a way that our tool allows you to collaborate directly with a supplier, understand their feedback from what they need support with and co-create a plan and next steps for action, um, allowing you to have a dialogue, a, a buyer supplier dialogue that ensures effective collaboration and action. Next slide, please, Jamie. Thank you. Okay, so now we the next two slides are getting a little bit into some great act, features that come out, some wonderful, this is the biodiversity map. Uh, so I'm really excited to share this particular aspect with you. And the slides are, this here is the map that's multi-tier. So you can look at your suppliers and locations from 
tier one, tier two, tier three. You have a rating scale on the left, if you can see, and that rating scale allows you to see your riskiest suppliers by color. It's a color legend. And then further up, you can drop down on the left and actually group your suppliers um, and then look at your suppliers specifically by group and then look at the risks that they have. So this is the multi-tier supplier mapping as part of the assessment. And then the next slide, Jamie. Thank you. And then key outcomes um, from what comes out from the assessment. So you can report on material impacts and dependencies. On the right hand side is an analytic, and this is a dashboard on the dashboard here on the right. And you see here where you will um, and you have a, a graph that comes out, and you can actually specifically see all high impact areas that are pre-populated based on the industries of the suppliers. For instance, the 24. 24.9%, which is the biggest section in all of, it's hard to read, understand, represents the buyer's combined different supply chains and shows the highest impact area and the most material biodiversity risk that's highlighted here is pressure on biodiversity and population. The next uh, underneath that is supplier comparison, which allows you to look at suppliers in a snapshot, supplier specific information by color. So you can see who are your highest performers and lowest performers. You can also look at specific information about their answers. So this really helps you prioritize action and then leads to supplier engagement for continuous improvement. And at this point, I want to say at Supply Shift, we know that supply chain sustainability is a journey and building valuable mapping and assessment processes in your procurement process and business practice is key to success. Thank you very much, Jamie. I know that ran a, a bit late. <laughs> no problem. We've got a few minutes left for Q&A. So we've got some great questions coming in uh, so far and we'll start to take those in a second. So thank you, Andrani. Thank you, everyone really insightful information. Um, what I uh, know about our biodiversity assessment is that we've uh, collaborated closely with the Science-Based Targets Network, and uh, it covers really clearly steps one and two of target setting the information you need to do that. Um, as far as we know, it's the only supplier assessment out there that really helps you understand the material issues in your supply chain, right? So that you can get the, the clear information that, that you need there. So um, I'm seeing some, most of the questions coming in uh, directed at supply ship, but feel free questions for all of the speakers are welcome here. We'll see how many we can take in the next three minutes. Um, the first one came in uh, a while ago and I was waiting to, to ask it to you, Indrani. So engaging with value chains uh, often is, is challenging, right? And suppliers basically don't want to provide information. Um, so maybe it's competitive, maybe they don't want to. How, how do we overcome this? Um, how, how does the tool help overcome it? But it just even from a more kind of uh, relationship perspective, um, is it possible to, to get data from upstream? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, Jamie. Yes. And in fact, um, so I'm going to go right to the tool in this very practical um, application to your question. And that is that this, the, our tool, particularly the assessment, there is um, uh, the way that the process and the way that we work with our customers is that we do lots of um, on, on, you know, training around really helping the supplier understand why is this important? Why are we asking this information and what will you be doing it? And, and so our capabilities and tool allows you to publish the analytics, publish the comparisons, share the information so that the supplier knows, okay, once this information um, is, is taken, they will, you know, we can see it and we can evaluate our own performance. That's one thing. And the second thing is like, and then it's an opportunity for you as a company to share your KPIs, share your visions and strategies. And once suppliers understand, I think, what the data is for, why it's being done, and how it's going to be used in general, if that's communicated by the company, um, that is very powerful. And we're seeing suppliers not only say, yes, I want to be a part of this, and now I have a clear understanding of working with you and what the expectations are. And this will actually also help my help my supplier suppliers set me up for success. So it's about building relationships and not expecting to get all the data in one go, but knowing that your real partners are going to come through and communicate clearly why you want the data, what you're going to do with it. Um, we do see um, transparency expanding over time, you know, 100%. Um, great. Um, other questions coming in. I really like this one with only a minute left. So maybe I'll just put this out to everybody. Um, 
it's about the positive side, right? We're talking about biodiversity impacts, negative impacts from suppliers. What about positive impacts? Um, so, you know, how do we how do we identify positive impacts? What are positive impacts that suppliers can have, uh, that companies can have on biodiversity? And maybe with just a minute left, I'll just allow anyone who wants to uh, provide some insights there uh, to answer that question. I'm happy to jump in here. I think just two quick thoughts from my side. Um, the first one is the positive impact itself on the production. Like for example, regenerative agriculture approach, it will make your crop more resilient. Um, it will, you know, just with the climate change and all the biodiversity loss, it will help you uh, uh, mitigate the risks um, in the long term. So it's good for your business anyway, but I think also it will help you to attract um, investment as well as you know, different contracting opportunities because, uh, you know, maybe downstream um, businesses will more and more be looking for businesses that don't have major risk on biodiversity. So um, I think these are the two positive aspects that I can think of. Yeah, if I can come in as well, I think it's a great question because there's definitely a, a shifting emphasis. I mean, obviously, managing those negative impacts is still underpinning action by businesses and suppliers and, and everyone. But there is this real shift towards pushing people to think about the positive contributions that they can make. And I think this is where alignment with the global biodiversity framework and the, the national action plans that the country, countries are working on is really important. So how can you work with your suppliers, with your landscapes, with your own operations to not only identify how you're managing those negative impacts, but making a really positive contribution towards those global national goals that are in place. Um, so I think it's a really nice note to end on and there's definitely ways in which that's happening and we're starting to see better commitments towards that as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Shell. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Indrani. Thank you, everyone uh, who's contributed to making this happen. We are now wrapping up. Um, so thanks all of you for joining. It's been a pleasure. I think key messages are impacts are real. The legislation reporting requirements are real. There are tools available for you to estimate what's going on. And now there are tools available for you to really dig into your supply chain to engage suppliers and know what's actually going on. Um, so um, good luck, everyone, with uh, your journeys on that. And please reach out to any of the speakers uh, or Supply Shift for more information. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Much. Thank you, everyone.